Hello, hello, hello! Welcome to Synergetic Games. My name is Natalie, and today we are going to be reading... Where did I put it? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I made an, I made a new little thumbnail and everything. Well, I say thumbnail. I mean... I mean... <laughs> I said thumbnail. I meant thumbnail, but what I meant was panel. So really, I'm just wrong in like two different ways already, and it's like... 30 seconds into the video <laughs> excluding the timer thank you so much for the hype uh how you been guys um I'm, yeah i made a panel and i try to i try to get the book cover to be the same as the one in the panel or the panels be the, the same as the book cover but it didn't work because apparently there's it's this has been reprinted like a million times What's the difference, really? Well, many, many. There, some would argue there were many differences, <laughs> but uh, I could not, I could not tell you what they were, um, in any expert sort of way. So, so that's where I'm at. I have been playing far too much. Um, he is, because it's one of the best sci-fi series ever written. Yeah, this copy I have here was published in 1979 so this book came straight out of the 70s um <laughs> the font's so small too oh my god <laughs> but I suppose if you're gonna do a thin book like this it makes sense oh my god I'm a I'm a bit intimidated by this actually like I'm pretty sure I've read this before, but like I've read it before, I know what happens, but at the same time, I know everybody else really loves this book, um, or anyone who's even remotely familiar with Douglas Adams. Um, and like, I just, um, I almost don't want to start, <laughs> but I got my drink. And I've got a book, so we're gonna we're gonna read for maybe like an hour or so. See see how it goes. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> um, I do have the first four books, so I've got four books in a trilogy. Um, apparently there's a fifth one that I didn't know about, but uh, I don't I don't, to the best of my knowledge, have that one. I might. I would have to dig around on my bookshelf. Um, anyway, um, we'll see, we'll see how this goes. And if you guys don't like it, you'll have to wait till the end of the book to say so, because it's not changing. He wrote that gently. That he did. That he did. Um, which I didn't actually realize until I watched it for a second time when I was like, huh, Douglas Adams. And I know you want me to watch the original one, and I have yet to dig around for it, but we'll we'll see. What year was the original uh, TV series adaptation? I'll have I'll have a poke around after the stream, maybe I don't know. I've uh, got uh, nothing else to do with my evening but sleep, probably. Okay, so. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Chapter 1 The house stood on a slight rise just on the edge of the village. It stood on its own and looked out over, over a broad spread of West Country farmland, not a remarkable house by any means. It was about thirty years old, squattish, squarish, made of brick, and had four windows set in, set in the front of a size of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye. The only person for whom the house was in any way special was Arthur Dent, and that was only because it happened to be the one he lived in. He had lived in it for about three years, ever since he had moved out of London because it made him nervous and irritable. He was about 30 as well, tall, dark-haired, and never quite at ease with himself. 
The thing that used to worry him most was the fact that people always used to ask him what he was looking so worried about. He worked in a... <laughs> He worked in local radio, which he always used to tell his friends was a lot more interesting than they probably thought. It was too. Most of his friends worked in advertising. On Wednesday night, it had rained very heavily. The lane was wet and muddy, but the Thursday morning sun was, but the Thursday morning sun was bright and clear and it shone on Arthur Dent's house for what, for what was to be the last time. It hadn't properly registered yet that, with Arthur Dent that the council wanted to knock it down and build a bypass instead. At eight o'clock on Thursday morning, Arthur Dent didn't feel very good. He woke up blearily, got up, wandered blearily around his room, opened a window, saw a bulldozer, found his slippers and stomped off, stomped off to the bathroom to wash. Toothpaste on the brush. So, scrub shaving mirror. Pointing at the ceiling, he adjusted it. For a moment it reflected a second bulldozer through, through the bathroom window. Properly adjusted, it reflected Arthur Dent's bristles. He shaved them off, washed, dried, and stomped off, and stomped off to the kitchen to find something pleasant to put in his mouth. Kettle, plug, fridge, milk, coffee. Yawn. The word bulldozer wandered through his mind for a moment in search of something to connect with. The bulldozer outside the kitchen window was quite a big one. He stared at it. Yellow, he thought, and stomped off back to his bedroom to get dressed. Passing the bathroom, he stopped to drink a large glass of water and another, and began to suspect that he was hung over. Why was he hung over? He'd been drinking the night. Had he been drinking the night before? He supposed that he must have been. He caught a glint of the glint in the shaving mirror. Yellow, he thought, and stomped on, and stomped on to the bathroom, to the bedroom. He stood and thought. The pub, he thought. Oh dear, the pub. He vaguely remembered being angry, angry about something that seemed important. He'd been telling people about it, telling people about it at great length. He rather suspected. His clearest visual reco recollection was, was of glazed looks on other people's faces. Something about a new bypass he'd just heard, he'd just found out about. It had been in the pipeline for months, only no one seemed to have known about it. Ridiculous. He took a swig of water. It would sort itself out, he'd decided. No one wanted a bypass. The council didn't have a leg to stand on. It would sort itself out. God, what a terrible hangover it had earned him, though. He looked at himself in the wardrobe mirror. He stuck out his tongue. Yellow, he thought. The word yellow wandered through his mind in search of something to connect with. Fifteen seconds later, he was out of the house and lying in front of a big yellow bulldozer that it was in fact that was advancing up his garden path. Mr. L. Prosa was, as they say, only human. In other words, he was a carbon-based bipedal life form descended from an ape. More specifically, he was forty, fat and shabby, and worked for the local council. Curiously enough, though, he didn't know it. He was also a direct male line descendant of Genghis Khan, although intervening generations and racial mixing had so, <laughs> had so juggled his genes that he had no discernible mong mongoloid characteristics. And the only vestiges left in Mr. L. Prosa's in vestiges left in Mis Mr. L. Prosa's ugh. In Mr. El Prosa, of his mighty ancestry, with a pronounced stoutness about the tum, and a predilection for little fur hats, he was by no means a great warrior. In fact, he was a nervous, worried man. Today, he was particularly particularly nervous and worried because something had gone seriously wrong with his job, which was to see that Arthur Dent's house got cleared out of the way before the day was out. 
come off it, Mr. Dent, he said. You can't win, you know. You can't lie in front of the bulldozer indefinitely. He tried to make his eyes blaze fiercely. But they just wouldn't do it. Arthur lay in the mud and squelched at him. I'm game, he said. You'll see who rusts first. I'm afraid you're going to have to accept it, said Mr. Proser, gripping his fur hat and rolling it around the top of his head. This bypass has got to be built, and it's going to be built. First I've heard of it, said, Mr. <laughs> said Arthur. Why has it got to be built? Mr. Proser shook a finger at him, shook his finger at him for a bit, then stopped and put it away again. What do you mean? Why has it got to be built? He said. It's a bypass. You've got to build bypasses. Bypasses are devices which allow some people to dash from point A to point B very fast, while other people dash from point B to point A very fast. People living at point C, being a point directly between directly in between are often given being a point directly in between are often given to wonders what's so great about point A that so many people from point B are so keen to get there and what's so great about point B that so many people are, are from point A that so many people from point A are keen to get there they often wish that people would just once and for all work out where the hell they want it to be. Mr. Prosa wanted to be at point D. Point D wasn't anywhere in particular. It was just any convenient place a very long way from points A, B and C. He would have a nice little cottage at point D with axes over the door and, a sp and spend a pleasant amount of time at point E which would be the nearest pub to point D. His wife, his wife, of course, wanted climbing roses, but he wanted axes. He didn't know why, he just liked axes. He flushed hotly under the derisive grins of the bulldozer drivers. You relate hard to the main character, yep. I think most of us do, to be honest. He shifted his weight from foot to foot, but it was equally uncomfortable on each. Obviously, somebody had been appallingly incompetent, and he hoped to God it wasn't him. Mr. Prosa said, You are quite entitled to make any suggestions or process at the appropriate time you know. At the appropriate time you know. Appropriate time, hooted Arthur. Appropriate time. The first I knew about it was when a workman arrived at my home yesterday. I asked him if he'd come to clean the windows and he said no, he'd come to demolish the house. You didn't tell me straight away. He didn't tell me straight away, of course. Oh no. First he wiped a couple of windows and charged me a fiver. Then he told me. But Mr. Dent, the plans have been available in the local planning office for the last nine months. Oh yes, well, as soon as I heard, I went straight around to see them yesterday afternoon. You hadn't exactly gone out of your way to call attention to them, had you? I mean, like actually telling anybody or anything. But the plans were on display. On display? I eventually had to go down to the cellar to find them. That's the display department with a torch. Ah, uh, well, the lights had probably gone. So at the stairs. But look, you found the notice, didn't you? Yes, said Arthur. Yes, I did. It was on display in the, in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet stuck in a disused lavatory with a sign on the door saying, beware of the leopard. A cloud passed overhead. It cast a shadow of Arthur Dent. <laughs> it cast a shadow over Arthur Dent as he lay propped up on his elbow in a cold in the cold mud. It cast a shadow over Arthur Dent's house. Mr. Prosser frowned at it. It's not as if it's a particularly nice house, he said. I'm sorry, but I happen to like it. You'll like the bypass. 
Oh, shut up, said Arthur Dent. Shut up and go away. And take your bloody bypass with you. You haven't got a leg to stand on, and you know it. Mr. Prosser's mouth opened and closed a couple of times whilst his mind was for a moment filled with inexplicable but terribly attractive visions of Arthur Dent's house being consumed with fire and Arthur himself running screaming from the blazing ruin with at least three hefty spears protruding from his back. Mr. Prosser was often bothered with visions like, <laughs> with visions like these and they made him feel very nervous. He stuttered for a moment and then pulled himself together. Mr. Dent, he said. Yes, hello, said Arthur. Some factual information for you. Have you any idea how much damage that bulldozer would suffer if I just let it roll straight over you? How much, said Arthur. None at all, said Mr. Proser, and stormed nervously off, wondering why his brain was filled with a thousand hairy horsemen all shouting at him. By a curious coincidence, none at all is exactly how much suspicion the ape descendant Arthur Dent had that one of his closest friends was not descended from an ape, but was in fact from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeus, and not from Guildford, as he as he usually usually exclaimed. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, my bad. I apologize. Thank you for the, cor the correction. Beetlejuice. Yes, I see that now. <laughs> Arthur Dent had, had never, ever suspected this. This friend of his had first arrived on the planet Earth some 15 Earth years previously, and he had worked hard to blend himself into Earth society with, it must be said, some success. For instance, he had spent these he had spent those 15 years pretending to be an out-of-work actor, which was plausible enough. He had made one careless blunder, though. Because he had skimped a bit on his preparatory research, the information he had gathered had led him to choose the name Ford Prefect as being nicely inconspicuous. He was not conspicuously tall. His features were striking, but not conspicuously handsome. His hair was wiry and gingerish and brushed backwards from the temples. His skin seemed to be pulled backwards from the nose. There was something very slightly odd about him, but it was diff difficult to say what it was. Perhaps it was that his eyes didn't seem to blink often enough. And when you talked to him for any length of time, your eyes began involuntarily to water on his behalf. Perhaps it was that he smiled slightly too broadly and gave people the unnerving impression that he was about to go for their go for their neck. Just don't say it three times. Not in a row, at least. He struck most of the friends he had made on Earth as an eccentric but harm as an eccentric but harmless one, an unruly boozer with some oddish behaviours. Oh, I love auditions. For instance, he would often gate crash university parties, get badly drunk, and start making fun of any astrophysicists he could find till he got thrown out. Sometimes he would get seized with oddly distracted moods and stare into the sky as if hypnotized until somebody asked him what he was doing. Then he would start he would start guiltily for a moment, relax, and grin. Oh, just looking for the flying saucers, he would joke, and everyone would laugh and ask him what sort of flying saucers he was looking for. Green ones, he would reply with a wicked grin, laugh, wi <laughs> laugh wildly for a moment, and then suddenly lunge for the nearest bar and buy an enormous round of drinks. Everything like this usually ended badly. Ford would get out of his skull on whiskey, huddle in a huddle into a corner with some girl and explain to her in slurred phrases that honestly the colour of the flying saucers didn't matter that, that much really. Thereafter staggering semi paralytic down the down the night streets to Beetlejuice. 
What? Down the night street. What? I skipped a line. The font's too small. I keep doing this. He would often ask passing policemen if they knew the way to Beetlejuice. The policeman would usually say something like, Don't you think it's about time you went off home, sir? I'm trying to, baby, I'm trying to, is what Ford invariably replied with on these occasions. In fact, what he was really looking for when he stared distractedly into the sky was any kind of flying saucer at all. The reason he said green was that green was the traditionally space liver <laughs> traditional space livery of the Beetlejuice trading scouts. Ford Prefect was desperate that any flying saucer at all would would arrive soon because fif because 15 years was as was a long time to get stranded anywhere particularly somewhere as mind-bogglingly dull as the earth ford wished that a flying saucer would arrive soon because he knew to how to flag flying saucers down and get lifts from them he knew how to see the, the marvel, how to see the marvels of the universe for less than thirty Altarian dollars a day. In fact, Ford Prefect, Prefect was a roving researcher for that wholly remarkable book, *The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy*. No, it, it seems fairly fairly boring. I mean, I ought to know. I mean, at least the animals are cute. Most of them. Human beings are great adapters, and by lunchtime, life in life in the environs of Arthur's house had settled into a steady routine. It was Arthur's accepted role to lie squelching in the mud, making the, making occasional demands to see his lawyer, his mother, or a good book. It was Mr. Prosser's accepted role to tackle Arthur with, the, with, to tackle Arthur with the occasional new ploy, such as, before the public good talk or mar or the march of progress talk, the, they knocked down, they knocked my house down once, you know, never look back talk and various other, cajoleries and threats. And it was the bulldozer, bulldozer. Dr Bulldozer driver's accepted role to sit around drinking coffee and experimenting with union regulations to see how they could turn the situation to their financial advantage. Prosser. <laughs> I've never seen this name written down, so fair enough. I'll do my best. Prosser. The earth moves slowly in its dior, dior, diurnal course. Is that is that is it diurnal? I think that's how you spell it. Diurnal. I'm gonna say diurnal. I don't even care if it's wrong. The sun was beginning to dry out the mud that Arthur lay in. A shadow moved across him again. Hello, Arthur, said the shadow. Arthur looked up and squinted into the sun and startled to see Ford Prefect standing above him. Ford, hello, how are you? Fine, said Ford. Look, are you busy? Am I busy? exclaimed Arthur. Well, I've got all these bulldozers and things to lie in front of because they, they'll they knock down my house if I don't. But other than that, well, no, not especially. Why? They don't have sar sarcasm on Beetlejuice, and Ford, Ford Prefect often failed to notice it unless he was concentrating. He said, good. Is there anywhere we can talk? What? said Arthur Dent. For a few seconds, Ford seemed to ignore him, and stared fixedly into the sky like a rabbit trying to run, o trying to get run over by a car. Then suddenly, he squatted down beside Arthur. 
We've got to talk, he said urgently. Fine, said Arthur. Talk and drink, said Ford. It's vitally important that we talk and drink now. We'll go to the pub in the village. He looked into the sky again, nervous, expectant. Look, don't you understand? shouted Arthur. He pointed at Prosser. <laughs> that man wants to knock my house down. Ford glanced at him, puzzled. Well, he can do that while you're away, can't he? he asked. But I don't want him to! Ah. Look, what's the matter with you, Ford? said Arthur. Humans are weird. Diurnal. Okay, good. I was right. Excellent. At least I think I was right. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing's the matter. Listen to me. I've got to tell you the most important thing you've ever heard. I've got to tell you now. And I've got to tell you in, in the saloon bar of the horse in the groom. But why? Because you're going to need a very stiff drink. Ford stared at Arthur, and Arthur was astonished to find that he, his his will beginning to weaken. He didn't realize that this was because of an old drinking game that Ford had learned to play in the hyperspace ports that served as a that served as the Madronite mining belts in the star system of Orion Be Beta. Beta? I'm going to say Beta. The game was not unlike Earth's game called was not unlike the Earth game called Indian Wrestling, and was played like this. Two contestants would sit either side of a table with a glass in front of with a glass in front of each of them. Between them would be placed a bottle of Jack's spirit, as immortalized in the in that ancient Orion mining song, Oh don't give me none of that old Jack spirit. No, don't you give me none of that old Jack spirit. For my head will fly, my tongue will lie, my eyes will fry, and I may die. Won't you pour me one more of that sinful old Jack spirit? Each of the two contestants would then concentrate, the, concentrate their will on the bottle and attempt to tip it and pour spirit into the glass of into the glass of his opponent, who would then have to drink it. The bottle would then be refilled. The game would be played again and again. Once you started to lose, you would prob you would probably keep losing, because one of the effects of Jank Spirit is to depress telepsychic tele tele power. <laughs> that old Jank Spirit. <laughs> And it's beta. <laughs> I'm going to say beta and you're all going to deal with it. <laughs> I have no idea what I initially said anymore. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just going to happen. As soon as the predetermined quantity had been consumed, the final loser would have to perform a forfeit, which was usually obscenely biological. Ford Prefect usually played to lose. Ford stared at Arthur, who began to think that perhaps he, he did want to go to the horse and groom after all. But what about my house? he asked plaintively. Ford looked across at Mr. Prosa, and suddenly a wicked thought struck him. He wants to knock your house down. Yes, he wants to build. And you can't because... And he can't because you're lying in front of his bulldozer. Yes, and... I'm sure we can come to some arrangement, said Ford. Excuse me, he shouted. Mr. Prosa, who was arguing with a, with a spokesman for the bulldozer drivers about whether or not Arthur Dent constituted a mental health hazard and how much how much they should get paid get paid if he did looked around he was surprised and slightly alarmed to see that arthur had, had company yes hello he called 
Has Mr. Dent come come to his senses yet? Can we, for a moment, call forward, assume that he hasn't? Well, sighed Mr. Prosser. Prosser. And can we also assume, said Ford, that he's going to be staying here all day? So, so all your men are going to be standing around all day doing nothing. Could be, could be. Well, if you're resigned to doing, to doing that anyway, you don't actually need him to lie there all the time, do you? What? You don't, said Ford patiently. Actually, need him here. Mr. Purser thought about this. Well, no, not as such, he said. Not exactly need. Mr. Purser was worried. He thought that one of them wasn't making a lot of sense. Ford said, so if you would just like to take, take it as read that, he'd act, that he's here, then he and I could slip off down to the pub for, for half an hour. How does that sound? Mr. Prosser thought it sounded perfectly potty. That sounds perfectly reasonable, he said, in a reassuring tone of voice, wondering who he was trying to reassure. And if you want to pop off for a quick one yourself later on, said Ford, we can always cover for you in return. Thank you very much, said Mr. Prosser, who no longer knew how to play... <laughs> Who no, who no longer knew how to play this at all. Thank you very much. Yes, that's very kind. He frowned, then smiled, then tried to do both at once. Failed. Grasped hold of his fur hat and rolled it pit and rolled it fitfully around on the top of his head. He could only assume that he had just won. So, continued Ford Prefect, if you would just like to come over here and lie down... What? said Mr. Purser. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, said Mr. Ford. Perhaps I hadn't made myself fully clear. Somebody's got to lie down in front of the, in front of the bulldozers, haven't they? Or there won't be anything to stop them driving into Mr. Dent's house. Or there won't be anything to stop them driving into Mr. Dent's house, will there? What? said Mr. Purser again. It's very simple, said Ford. My client, Mr. Dent, says that he... He will stop lying here in the mud in the soul, on the sole condition that you come and you come and take over for him. What are you talking about? said Arthur. But Ford nudged him with his shoe to be quiet. You want me, said Mr. Proser, spelling out this new thought to himself, to come and lie there. Yes. In front of the bulldozer. Yes. Instead of Mr. Dent. Yes. In the mud. In, as you say, the mud. As soon as Mr. Proser realized that he was subconsciously the sub, he was substantially the loser after all, it was as if the weight lifted itself off his shoulders. This was more like the world he this was more like the world as he knew it. He sighed. In return for which you will take Mr you will take Mr. Dent with you down to the pub. That's it, said Mr. Ford. That's it exactly. Mr. Prosser took a few nervous steps forward and stopped. Promise, he said. Promise, said Mr. Ford. He turned to Arthur. Come on, he said to him. Get up and let that man lie down. Arthur stood up, feeling as if he was in a dream. Ford beckoned Mr. Prosser, who sadly, awkwardly, sat down in the mud. He felt that his whole life was some kind of dream, and he sometimes wondered whose it was and whether they were enjoying it. The mud folded itself around his, his, <laughs> around his bottom and his arms and oozed into his shoes. Ford looked at him severely, and no sneaking knocking Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dent's house down while he's away, all right, he said. The mere thought, growled Mr. Proser, hadn't even begun to speculate. He continued, settling himself, settling himself back, about the merest possibility of crossing my mind. He saw the bulldozer driver's union representative approaching and 
and let his head sink back down and closed his eyes. He was trying to, to marshal his arguments for proving that he did not now constitute a mental, mental health hazard himself. He was far from certain about this. His mind seemed to be full of noise, horses, smoke, and the stench of blood. This always happened when he felt miserable and put up or put upon. He had never, he had never been able to explain it to himself. In a high dimension of which we know nothing, we know nothing. The mighty Khan bellowed with rage, but Mr. Prosa only trembled slightly and whimpered. He began to feel little pricks, little pricks of water behind his eyelids. Bureaucratic cock-ups, angry men lying in the mud, indecipherable strangers handing out inexplicable humiliations, and and an unidentified army of horsemen laughing at him in his head. What a day! What a day, Ford Prefect knew. What a day! Ford Prefect knew that it wouldn't matter a pair if. Wouldn't matter a pair of Dingo's kidneys, whether Arthur's house got knocked down or not now. Arthur remained very worried. But can we trust him, he said. Myself, I'd trust him to the ends of the earth, said Ford. Oh yes, said Arthur. And how far is that? About twelve minutes away, said Ford. Come on, I need a drink. Okay. Word ban. Ward. Got ya. Chapter 2. Here's what the Encyclopedia Galactica has to say about alcohol. It says that alcohol is a colourless, volatile liquid formed by the fermentation of sugars and also notes its intoxicating effect on certain carbon-based life forms. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy also maintains... What time is it? Okay. Also, men also mentions. Sorry, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy also mentions alcohol. It says that the best drink in existence is the Pangalactic Gargle Blaster. It says that the effect of drinking a Pangalactic Gargle Blaster is like having your brain smashed, <laughs> smashed out by a slice of lemon wrapped around a large gold brick. The guide also tells you on which planets the best pangalactic gargle blasters are mixed, how much you can expect to pay for one, and what and what voluntary organizations exist to help you rehabilitate afterwards. The guide even tells you how you can mix one yourself. Take the juice from one bottle of that old jank spirit, it says. Pour into one measure of water from the seas of Santraginus Santraginus 5. Oh, that Santraginian seawater, it says. Oh, those Santraginian fish. Allow three cubes of Arcturan Megogen to melt into the mixture. It must be properly iced or the benzene is lost. Allow four litres of Thallian marsh, ga marsh gas marsh gas to bubble through it in, mem in memory of all those happy hikers who, who have died of pleasure on the marshes of Thalia. Over the, over the back of the silver spoon float a measure of quillactin, quillactin hypermint extract, redolent of all the heady odours of the dark quillactin, quillactin zones. Oh my god, all these names. Collecting zone, subtle, sweet, and mystic. 
drop in the tooth drop in the tooth of an Algolian sun tiger. Watch it dissolve. Spread the fires of the Algonian suns deep into the heart of the drink. Sprinkle xamphor. Add an olive. Drink, but very carefully. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sells rather better than, an, than the Encyclopedia Galactica. Six pints of bitter. said Toyota Prefect <laughs> to the to the barman of the horse and groom. And quickly, please, the world's about to end. The barman of the horse and groom didn't deserve this sort of treatment. He was a dignified old man. He pushed his glasses up his nose and blinked at Toyota Prefect. Toyota ignored him and stared out of the window. So the barman looked instead at Arthur, who, sh who shrugged helplessly and said nothing. So the barman said, Oh yes, sir, nice weather for it, and started pulling pints. He tried again. Going to watch the match this afternoon then? Toyota glanced around at him. No, no point, he said, and looked back out, the back out of the window. What's that? Foregone conclusion. Then you reckon, sir? said the barman, Arsenal without a chance. No, no, said Ford, it's just that the world's about to end. Oh yes, sir, so you said, said the barman. Did I say, did I say Toyota? Should have said Toyota. Said the barman, looking over his glasses at Arthur. Lucky escape for Arsenal if it if it did. Toyota looked back at him, genuinely surprised. No, not really, he said. He frowned. The barman breathed in heavily. There you are, sir. Six pints, he said. Arthur smiled at him. Arthur smiled at him wanely and shrugged again. He turned. He turned and smiled wanely at the rest of the pub, just in case any of them had heard what was going on. None of them had, and none of them could understand what he was smiling at them for. A man sitting next to Toyota at the bar looked, <laughs> looked, at, looked at the two men, looked at the six pints, did a swift burst of mental arithmetic, arrived at an answer he liked, and grinned a stupid, hopeful grin at them. Get off, said Toyota. They're ours giving him a look that would have made an ang an Algolian sun tiger get on with what he what he was doing and uh, that is the end of uh, the word ban it went, on, it went on for five minutes I should probably stipulate that these things last for five minutes but sometimes I forget and it keeps going Ford slapped a five pound note on the bar he said, keep the change. What, from a fiver? Thank you, sir. You've got ten minutes left to spend it. The barman decided to simply walk away for a bit. Ford, said Arthur, would you please tell me what the hell is going on? Drink up, said Ford. You've got three pints to get to get through. Three pints, he said. At lunchtime, the man looked the man next to Ford grinned and nodded happily. Ford ignored him. He said, he said, time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. Very deep, said Arthur. You should send that to the Reader's Digest. They've got a page for people like you. Drink up. Why three pints all of a sudden? Muscle relaxant, you'll need it. Muscle relaxant, muscle relaxant. Arthur stared into his beer. Did I do anything wrong today, he said. Or has the world always been like this and I've been too wrapped up in myself to notice? All right, said Ford. I'll try to explain. How long have we known each other? How long? Arthur thought. Uh, about five years, maybe six, he said. Most of it seemed to make some kind of sense at the time. 
All right, said Ford. How would you react if, if I said that I'm not from Guildford at, after all, but from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Beetlejuice? Arthur, sh Arthur shrugged in a so-so sort of way. I don't know, he said, taking a pull of beer. Why? Do you think it's the sort of thing you're likely to say? Ford gave up. It really wasn't worth bothering at the moment. What with the world being about to end, he just said, drink up. It's 1978. <laughs> Inflation is disgusting. I think a fiver wouldn't even get you one pint in some places these days. I suppose it depends on the size of pint, but <laughs> he added perfectly factually, the world's about to end. Arthur gave the rest of the pub another wing smile. The rest of the pub frowned at him. A man waved at him to stop smiling at him and to mind his own business. This must be Thursday, Arthur said to himself, sinking low over his beer. I never could get the hang of Thursdays. I'm going to the wrong places. <laughs> you d don't be silly. I live in the South. <laughs> now Tesco's could get me some fairly large beers for a fiver. Gotta say. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've ever actively bought a pint. I usually just have like, um, I don't know, a vodka and coke or a apple tizer and lemonade or something like that. I don't, I, mm, apple, apple schnapps and lemonade or something. Not gonna lie, Tesco was still more expensive than when there were from Tesco's. What, really? Was it? Okay, well, there you go then. Pints about three or four pounds. Okay, well that's reasonable. But I've definitely been to pubs in London. The, the drinks were just extortionate. It's unbelievable. Lime and soda is my go-to if I do end up anywhere. Fair enough. Um, but a lot of things are a lot of things are cheaper than just straight pints. Even well, I would, I'd say even wine, but that's not true at all. Like, I think if it's a mixed drink and you water it down, it's much cheaper because you're just getting like a shot of something. A bottle of mead for like 12 pounds. <laughs> yep, sounds about right. Hi! Hi, you! Ooh. Sorry, my cat was being within my proximity again. Mm hmm, mm hmm, yeah. Okay, we're going to read chapter three and um, see how that goes. Right, chapter three. On this particular Thursday, something was moving quietly through the ionosphere many miles above the surface of the planet. Several somethings, in fact, several dozen huge yellow chunkies slab like somethings huge as office blocks, silent as birds. They soared with ease, basking in, in electromagnetic rays from the star soul, from the star soul. Biding their time, grouping, preparing, the planet beneath them was almost perfectly ob oblivious of their presence, which was just how they wanted it for the moment. The huge yellow somethings went unnoticed at Goonie Hilly, they passed over Cape Canaveral without a flip. Woomera and Jordrill Bank looked straight through them, which was a pity because it, it was exactly the sort of thing they'd been looking for all these years. The only place they registered at all was was on the was on a small black device called a sub-ether. 
a sub-ether sensomatic, which winked away quietly to itself. It nestled, it nestled in the darkness inside a leather satchel which Ford Prefect habitually wore slung around his neck. The contents of Ford Prefect's satchel were, satchel were quite interesting. Were quite interesting, in fact, and would have made any Earth physicist's eyes pop out of that pop out of his head, which is why he always concealed them by keeping a couple of dog-eared scripts from plays he pretended he was auditioning for stuffed in the stuffed in top stuffed in the top oh my god besides the sub ether sensomatic and the scripts had the had an electromagnetic electronic thumb a short squat black rod smooth and matte with a couple of flat switches and dials at one end he also had a device which looked rather like a, a largest electronic calculator. Large-ish. Oh my god. This had about a hundred tiny flat buttons and a screen about four inches square on which any one of a million pages could be summoned at a moment's notice. It looked insanely complicated. And this was one of the reasons why the snug plastic cover it fitted in it fitted into had the words don't panic printed printed on it in large friendly letters. The other reason that this this device was in fact the most remarkable of all books ever to come out come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The reason why it was published in the form of a micro sub sub meson electronic component is that if it were to be printed in normal book form, an interstellar hitchhiker would require several inconveniently large buildings to carry it all around in. Beneath that, Ford Prefect Satchel satchel were a few biros and a notepad and a largest bath towel from Marks and Spencer's I do like largest bath towels the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy has a few things to say on the subject of towels a towel, it says, is about the most massively useful thing an interstellar hitchhiker can have. Partly, it has it has great practical value. You can wrap it around you for warmth as you bound across the cold moons of Jagland Beta. You can lie on it in a, on the brilliant marble sand beaches of Sat. Santa, Santa Genus 5, inhaling the heady sea vapours. You can sleep under it beneath the stars which shine so redly on the desert world of Cacrafoon. Use it to sail a mini raft down, down a slow, heavy river, heavy river, down the slow, heavy river moth. Wet it for use in hand-to-hand -hand combat, wrap it around your head to ward off noxious noxious fumes, or avoid the gaze of the ravenous bug blatter beast of Troll. A mind-bogglingly stupid animal. It assumes that if you can't see it, it can't see you. Daft as a brush, but very ravenous. You can wave your you, you can wave your towel in emergencies as a distress signal, and you of course can dry yourself off with it if it still seems to be clean enough. More importantly, a towel has immense psychological value. For some reason, if a strag strag, a non hitchhiker, discovers that a hitchhiker has has his towel with him, he will automatically assume that he is also in possession of a toothbrush, face flannel, soap, tin of biscuits, flask, compass, map, ball of string, gnat spray, 
wet weather gear, spacesuit, etc., etc. Furthermore, a strag will then happily lend the hitchhiker any of these or a dozen other items that the hitchhiker might accidentally have lost. Lost. <laughs> What the Strag will think is that any man who can hitch, hitch the length and breadth of the galaxy, rough it, slum it, and struggle against terrible odds, win through and still know where his towel is, is clearly a man to be reckoned with. Hence a phrase which has passed into, into hitchhiking slang, as in, hey, you sass that, you sass that hoopy Ford prefect? There's a fruit who really knows where his towel is. Sass, no. Be aware of. Meet, have sex with. Hoopy, really together guy. Frood, really amazingly together guy. Nestling quietly on top of the towel in Ford Prefect's satchel, the sub-ether sensomatic began to wink more quickly. Miles above the surface of the planet, the huge yellow somethings began to fan out. A jaw-drill bank, someone decided it was time for a nice relaxing cup of tea. You got a towel with you, said Ford suddenly to Arthur. Arthur, struggling through his third pint, looked around at him. Why, what? No, should I have? He had given up on being surprised. There didn't seem to be any point any longer. Ford clicked his tongue in irritation. Drink up, he urged. At that moment, the dull sound of a rumbling crash from outside filtered through the low murmur of, murmur of the pub. Through the sound of the jukebox, through the sound of the man next to Ford hiccuping over, over the whiskey Ford had eventually bought for him, Arthur choked on his beer and leapt to his feet. What's that? He helped. Don't worry, said Ford. They haven't started yet. Thank God for that, said Arthur, and relaxed. It's probably just your house being knocked down, said Ford, downing his last pipe. Pint. <laughs> what? shouted Arthur. Suddenly, Ford's spell was broken. Arthur looked wildly around him and ran into the window. Oh, ran, ran to the window, my bad. My God, they are! They're knocking my house down! What the hell am I going to do? What the hell am I doing in the pub, Ford? It hardly makes any difference at this stage, said Ford. Let them have their fun. Fun? yelped Arthur. Fun! He quickly checked out the window again, and they were talking about the same thing. Damn their fun! He hooted and ran out of the pub, furiously waving a nearly empty beer glass. He made no friends at all in the pub that lunchtime. Stop you vandals, you homewreckers, bawled Arthur. You half crade Visigoths, stop, stop, will you? What's a Visigoth? Seriously, what is that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Where am I? I've lost my place. But okay, busy boss. There we go. Ford would have to go after him, turning quickly to the barman. He asked for four packets of peanuts. There you are, sir," said the man, slapping the packets on the bar. Twenty-eight pence, if you if you'd be so kind. Ford was very kind. He gave the barman another five-pound note and told him to keep the change. The barman looked at it and then looked at Ford. He suddenly shivered. He'd experienced a momentary sensation that he didn't understand because no one on earth had ever experienced it before. In moments of great stress, every life form that exists gives out a tiny subliminal signal. The signal simply communicates an exact and almost pathetic sense of how far that, that being is from the place of his birth. On earth, it is never possible to be further than 16,000 miles from your birthplace which really isn't very far. So such signals are too minute to be noticed. Ford Prefect was at, at, was at this moment under, under great stress, 
and he was born 600 light years away in the near vicinity of Betelgeuse. Oh! Hi Biz Jacket, I got you. Makes sense, I guess. Uh huh. The barman reeled for a moment, hit by a shocking, incompre incompre comprehensible sense of distance. He didn't know what it meant. But he looked at Ford Prefect with a new sense of respect, almost awe. Are you serious, sir? He said in a small whisper, which had the effect of silencing the pub. You think the world's going to end? Yes, said Ford. But this afternoon... Ford had recovered himself. He was at his he was at his flippest. Yes, he said gaily. In less than two minutes, I would estimate. The barman couldn't believe this conversation he was having. But he couldn't believe the sensation he had just had either. Isn't there anything we can do do about it then? He said. No, nothing, said Ford, stuffing the peanuts into his pocket. Someone in the hushed bar suddenly laughed raucously at, the st at how stupid everyone had become. The man sitting next to Ford was a bit s was a bit sozzled by now. His eyes weaved their way up to Ford. I thought, he said, that if the world was going to end, we were meant to lie down or put a paper bag over our head or something. If you like, yes, said Ford. That's what they told us in the army, said the man, and his eyes began the long trek back towards his whiskey. Will that help? asked the barman. No, said Ford, and gave him a friendly smile. Excuse me, he said, I've got to go. With a wave, he left. The pub was silent for a moment, for a moment longer, and then, embarrassingly enough, the man with the raucous laugh did it again. The girl he had dragged dragged along to the pub with him, had grown to loathe him dearly over the last hour. And it was probably, and it would probably have been a, a great satisfaction to her to know that in a minute and a half, in a minute and a half or so, he would suddenly evaporate into a whiff of hydrogen, ozone and carbon monoxide. However, when the moment came, she, she too would, she would be too busy evaporating herself to notice it. The barman cleared his throat. He heard himself say, Last orders, please. The huge yellow machines began to sink downwards to, downwards and to, and to move faster. Ford knew they were there. This wasn't the way he had wanted it. Running up the lane, Arthur had nearly reached his house. He didn't notice how cold he had, it had suddenly become. He didn't notice the wind. He didn't notice the sudden irrational squall of rain. Squall. Sorry. <laughs> Just um, thinking about Brett. He didn't notice anything but, anything but the caterpillar bulldozers crawling over the rubble that had been his home. You barbarians! He yelled. I'll sue the council for every penny it's got. I'll have you hung, drawn, and quartered, and whipped, and boiled, until, until, until you've had enough. Ford was running after him very fast, very, very fast. And then, I'll do it, and then I'll do it again, yelled Arthur. And when I've finished, I will take all the little bits, and I will jump on them. Arthur didn't notice that the men were running from the bulldozers. He didn't notice that Mr. Purso was staring hectically into the sky. What Mr. Purso had noticed was the huge yellow somethings that were screaming through the clouds. Impossibly huge yellow somethings. And I will carry on jumping on them, yelled Arthur, still running until I get blisters, or I can think of anything even more unpleasant to do. And then, Arthur tripped and fell headlong, rolled and landed flat on his back. 
At last he noticed the something that was going on. At last he noticed that something was going on. His finger shot upwards. What the hell's that? he shrieked. Whatever it was raced across the sky in its monstrous yellowness, tore the sky apart with mind-buggering noise, and leapt off into the distance, leaving a gap of air, leaving a leaving the gaping air to shut behind it with a bang that drove your ears six feet into your skull. Another one followed that did exactly the same thing, only louder. It's difficult to say exactly what people on the surface surface of the planet were doing now because they didn't really know what they were going what they were doing themselves none of it had made none of it had made a lot of sense running into houses running out of houses howling noiselessly at the noise all around the world city streets exploded with people cars slewed into each other slewed into each other as the noise fell on them and then rolled off and then rolled off like a tidal wave over hills and valleys, deserts and oceans, seeming to flatten everything it hit. Only one man stood and watched the sky, stood with terrible sadness in his eyes and rubber bungs in his ears. He knew exactly what was happening and had known ever since his sub-ether sensomatic had started winking in the dead of night in the dead of night beside his pillow and woken him with a start. It was what he had waited for all these years, but then he had deciphered the signal pattern sitting alone in his small dark room, sitting alone in his small dark room, a darkness, a coldness had gripped him and squeezed his heart. Of all the races in all the galaxy who had who could have come and said a big hello to the planet Earth, he thought. Didn't it just have to be the Vogons? Still, he knew what he had to do. As the Vogon craft screamed through the air, high above him, he opened his satchel. He threw, he threw away a copy of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. He threw away a copy of Godspell. He wouldn't need them where he was going. Everything was ready. Everything was prepared. He knew where his towel was. There are Germanic people who sat room in like the 4th century, okay. I mean, both apply, I suppose. A sudden silence hit the earth. If anything, it was worse than the noise. For a while, nothing happened. The great ships hung motionless in the sky over every nation on Earth. Motionless, they hung, huge, heavy, steady in the sky, a blasphemy against nature. Many people went straight into shock as their minds tried to encompass what they were looking at. The ships hung in the sky in much the same way that bricks don't. And still nothing happened. Then there was a slight whisper, a sudden spacious whisper of open ambient sound. Every hi-fi set in the world, every stair, every radio, every television, every cassette recorder, every woofer, every tweeter, every mid-range driver in the world quietly turned itself on. Every tin can, every dustbin, every window, every car, Every wine glass, every sheet of rusty metal became activated as an acoustically perfect sounding board. For the earth passed, before the earth passed away, it was going to be treated to the very ultimate in sound reproduction. The greatest public address system ever built, but there was no there was no concert, no music, no fanfare, just a simple message. People of Earth, your attention, please. A voice said. And it was wonderful. Wonderful, perfect, 
qu quadraphonic sound with distortion levels so low as to make a brave man weep. This is Prostetnik Bogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council. The voice continued. As you will no doubt be aware, the plans for development of the outlying regions of the galaxy require the building of a hyperspatial express route through your star system and regrettably your planet is one of those scheduled for demolition. The process will take slightly less than two of your Earth minutes. Thank you. The PA died away. Uncomprehending terror settled on, on the watching people of Earth. The terror moved slowly through the through the gathered clouds as they were as if they were iron fillings on a sheet of board on a sheet of broad and magnetic on a, what is this as if they were iron fillings on a sheet of broad and a magnet was moving beneath them okay there was a we i don't know what a sheet of broad is i've never heard of it I feel, I feel like I'm reading this like I've never read it before, and I'm pretty sure I have. <laughs> the terror moves slowly through the... Where am I? Oh no, sorry. I just entirely skipped several paragraphs. Okay. Before the earth passed away, it was go blah blah blah. Okay, no, I, I lied to you. Panic sprouted again, despite fleet desperate fleeing panic, but there was nowhere to flee to. Observing this, the Vogons turned on their PA again, and it said, and it said, there's no point in acting all surprised about it. All the planning charts and the demolition orders have been on display in your local planning department in Alpha Centauri for 50 of your Earth years, so you've had plenty of time to lodge any formal to lodge any formal complaint and it's far too late to start making a fuss about it now the pa fell silent again and its echo drifted off across the land the huge ships turned slowly in the sky with easy power on the underside of each of a hatch on on the underside of each a hatchway opened and an an empty black square. By this time, somebody somewhere must have manned a radio transmitter, located a wavelength, and a broadcast and broadcast a message back to the Vogon ships to plead on behalf of the on behalf of the planet. Nobody ever heard what they said; they only heard the reply. The PA slammed back into life again. The voice and. The voice was annoyed. It said, What do you mean you've never been to Alpha Centauri? For heaven's sake, mankind, it's only four light years away, you know. I'm sorry, but if you can't be bothered to take an interest in local affairs, that's your lookout. <laughs> that's your own lookout. Energize the demolition beams. Light poured out of the hatchways. I don't know, said the voice on the PA. A pathetic bloody planet. No sympathy at all. It cut off. There was a terrible, ghastly silence. There was a terrible, ghastly noise. There was a terrible, ghastly silence. The Vogon Constructor Fleet coasted away into, into the inky, starry void. And, uh... That'll be that. We'll be back with chapter four next week. I hope you guys enjoyed. Re uh, I hope you guys enjoyed tolerating my garbage reading. Um, I'm having a lot of fun reading this already. I do. I do. I gotta say, I do love the start of um, Hitchhiker's Guide. It's, it's so solid, and I love the parallel between like. 
the demolition of Arthur's house and also the demolition of the planet. It's very, it's uh, topical, to say the least. <laughs> Um, but I think we've we've read enough for the evening. Thank you so much for uh, tolerating all of my mispronunciations and the fact that I just can't read today. Um, but I did enjoy it. We'll be back on Monday with um, Final Fantasy VIII for the first time in like a month. I swear to God. Poor Final Fantasy. It's one of those games that it's so long that you really shouldn't put it on the back burner, but it's always Final Fantasy on my, on my channel. Or, or The Witcher that gets put on hold an awful lot. And I'll be honest, I swear, like, there were a few occasions where I I intentionally was like, oh no, it's, it's, we'll have to skip The Witcher this week. Oh dear. And then other times it just, it just, so happened that way um <laughs> yes i promise we will be back on monday um hopefully for longer than an hour and a half let's let's be honest that's that's my goal i want to go for longer than an hour and a half and you are not allowed to let me stop okay you're not allowed to let me stop And we'll be back next week with uh, more Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um. Ah. Ooh. Tell you what, why don't we pop by and give Marcus a little rate. He is playing Civ City. Sorry, Civilization 6. I mean, Sid Meier's Civilization 6. That's what we're doing. Um, so... I will see you there. Sleep well when you go. If it is not your bedtime, have a great time zone. And I will see you on Monday. Good night, guys. <laughs>